X abandoned me and vanished with his affair partner leaving his affair child at my doorstep. So I adopted him, but four years later he came back and wanting to be a father again. My, F29, life at this point is nothing short of a TV drama that I was reluctantly made a part of. I have faced every trial that life has thrown my way, but now it is getting a little too much. I was finally on the verge of moving on and restarting my life, but my dear ex-husband Wes has come back and made life miserable and difficult for me all over again. I got married to my husband quite early when I was 21 years old, and he was 25. We were childhood sweethearts, and I always knew that he was the guy I wanted to spend my life with. He had been my senior in school and lived just two blocks away. I always had a crush on him, and I am sure he knew that. Heck, the entire school knew it. But he never tried to pursue me. I think the age gap deterred him, and rightly so, or it would have been very creepy and problematic otherwise. Once he graduated from school, he went on to study engineering at one of the top colleges in the country. When he left, I was just 14 years old and was getting out of the clingy and cringe phase of my teens. I outgrew my crush on him, and it was easier because we were not in contact. I stopped keeping tabs on him, and he became a faint memory in my mind by the time I graduated from school four years later. When I was in my first year of college, I happened to bump into him in a club I was partying in. I was there with my friends, and one of my friends, Hera, told me that a guy had been checking me out for a long time. When I looked over in that direction, I didn't recognize him. He looked familiar, but I was too drunk to even place him correctly. I told Hera to ignore him and continued partying, but she said that he was being really weird and that I needed to confront him or she would. The thing with Hera is that she has a very bad mouth, and I knew that if she went over to talk to the guy, it would just end up in a lot of drama and chaos, and I didn't want that spoiling my night. I told her that I would talk to him and that she didn't have to worry. I went over to the guy and asked him what his deal was, but he simply said that I resembled someone he knew from school, someone named Sarah. We got to talking, and I then realized that he was the same guy I had a huge crush on in school. By that point in time, I was completely over him and could actually joke about it and make fun of myself. He asked for my number, but initially, I thought nothing of it. Gradually, however, it became evident that he was trying to pursue me. And God, it felt so validating. Here was a man who was chasing me like a cutesy little lover boy, and he was the same guy I used to blush around for years and years when I was a pimply teenager. Honestly, the minute I saw him, I developed a crush on him again, but I let him pursue me for a while. I was loving the chase, and I was not going to let him off easy. He had graduated from college by then and was doing quite well for himself. Soon, as we became friends, I realized that I could go to him for emotional support, I could talk to him and feel better. It felt like a true companionship. We got close pretty soon, and it was like having a crush on my best friend. Six months after our chance meeting, he asked me out, and that was when my belief in our togetherness was reaffirmed. I had thought that I would end up with him ever since I was 12 years old, but let's be real, that was just a kid's wishful thinking. I had let go of that fantasy as I grew up, especially after he left for college. But when he asked me out, I knew that we were endgame, and nothing could ever keep us apart. I wish somebody had told me that I was about to make the biggest mistake of my life and that this man would be the reason for so much mental agony and tears that words could not describe. Two years later, we got married. I was still in college when we were married, but that wasn't an issue because we were madly in love, sure about each other, and he was doing really well for himself, so we were sorted on the financial front until I finished my degree. It was an intimate ceremony with only close family, and I thought that was the best day of my life. It turns out it was actually my biggest mistake. I completed my education and picked up a job, and both our incomes combined allowed us to afford and enjoy a good lifestyle from a young age. We were very happy, at least that's what I thought. I tried my best to be a good wife and friend to him, and I had no complaints from him either. Of course, we did have our ups and downs like any couple, and it was not always rosy, but we knew where our priorities lay right after graduation, we started trying for a baby. Wes had always wanted a large family, and I knew we could afford it, so I was on board too. Ideally, I would have preferred if we took some time to ourselves, but he really wanted it, so I went along with it. We weren't getting any younger anyway, and I know that it's not always easy trying to conceive. I had hoped it would be quick and joyful, but I never knew that I was in for some of the most heartbreaking months of my life. We tried a lot. Initially, we were not stressed. We were two young and healthy individuals, and neither of us had any medical history. Ideally, it shouldn't have been a problem at all. But somehow, we were unable to conceive. By about the fourth month of trying, I started getting a little stressed and disheartened. Even though it was mostly Wes' idea, I had grown to like the idea and was looking forward to expanding the family. By the six-month mark, I knew something was wrong, and I told Wes that we needed to go to the doctor, but he was still optimistic. He said that it just takes time for some people, and unfortunately, we were one of those. I did not have a good feeling about this, but I didn't say anything because I didn't want to dampen his spirits. Plus, I knew that what he had said held some truth to it. There could be multiple factors behind why we weren't able to conceive. We kept on trying, but we had no luck. After another three months, things got weird and tense at home. 
I was mad at Wes because he wasn't willing to go to a doctor for checkups and to see what was really wrong. He was mad at me because he felt I was stressing out a lot, both because of work and because of this personal struggle, which was then having a poor impact on our chances of conception. Both of us were not willing to listen to each other, and it was like we had reached a stalemate. Ultimately, I decided, or rather, in hindsight, Wes manipulated me into quitting my job because he made enough for the both of us anyway so that I would be able to relax and just focus on the family. I was a fool for listening to him, but I did it nonetheless. I knew that this was the only way out of this rut, and to be honest, I was hoping that this little theory of his would be proved right, and we would end up with the baby we had been trying so hard for. I quit my job, I did everything he asked me to, but it just did not work. I was getting frustrated, and so was he, and ultimately, both of us realized that we had no option other than going to a doctor and seeing what the issue was. We had to take multiple trips to the doctors and multiple tests, and at the end of it, we found out that I would never be able to conceive Wes kids naturally. It was a devastating blow to both of us. I was perfectly healthy and fertile otherwise, but we were just not a good match, unfortunately. Think Monica and Chandler from friends, but the only difference was that I had absolutely no support from my husband, let alone support in the way Chandler stood with Monica. It was a trying time for us as a couple, and we took some distance from each other. He blamed me for being the one with the problem because he did not want to admit that it was something that no one could have anticipated and that if it was, in fact, a problem, both of us were equal parties to it. He was too misogynistic and regressive in his thinking to see the issue as it actually was, and it just created a lot of bitterness and resentment between us. We went for months without talking to each other. We weren't even roommates at that point because I had shifted to another room. All this tension took a huge toll on my mental health. Wes at least had work to escape too. I had nothing to look forward to. No baby, no job, and now a husband who didn't talk to me or who thought I was the problem and the reason why he wouldn't get his dream family. He had shown me literally every red flag, waved it in front of my eyes, and I should have taken them for what they were and left him back then. But I thought we could get through this and that it was just a rough patch. Despite being the one who was hurt more, I ended up taking the first step toward reconciliation. It took us a lot of therapy and counseling to get back together in a solid and loving partnership. In our sessions with the counselor, a lot of unresolved feelings came to the surface from both of our sides, and a lot of harsh words were spoken. It wasn't just him who was being hurtful. I was mean and nasty as well. We were both just suffering, and instead of dealing with this together like partners, we were involved in a perpetual blame game, and were just not willing to see the situation for what it actually was. Our therapist, however, was a godsend, and slowly but surely, things started looking better. I thought that the worst was finally over and that we could now start looking towards the future, but I just didn't realize how wrong I was, and the reason for his changed behavior was something else entirely. I was too blind and too in love to see the signs for what they were, and I just allowed this man to walk all over me and break me in ways I hadn't even conjured in my worst nightmares. Like I said, things got better in a few months after therapy, and we started going back to normal. I had picked up a new job, and while it didn't pay as much as the previous one, it was still good, and it kept me occupied. Wes and I didn't talk about kids after that, and our therapist had advised us to broach the topic very gently, and preferably only after a couple of more sessions. I was still hurt about the entire situation, but my outlook had changed a lot. I realized that even though we could not be biological parents, we could adopt and create a family that way. I wasn't sure if Wes would be okay with this, which is why I didn't say much, but I genuinely thought this was a good idea and one that we could exercise. By this time, it had been around three years of our marriage. And while Wes never again brought up the topic of kids, we were getting used to our new normal. However, a year later, I got the biggest blow of my life. COVID had just started, and in the initial stages, we were all worried about what the disease was, and we were just locked in at home. Both Wes and I were working from home, and at that point, there was so much uncertainty that nobody knew when things would get normal again. And one day, Wes just vanished. I was working, and he said that he was going to get some groceries. I told him to lock the door on his way out and continued working. An hour later, I hear the bell ring. I remember feeling annoyed because it could only have been Wes, and I had explicitly told him to lock the door and take the keys so that he didn't disturb my work. I went to open the door, and I saw a young boy standing there with a bag and a letter in his hand. He told me that daddy and mommy had given the letter to him, and I was supposed to read it. When I saw the letter, my heart shattered into a million pieces. The letter was addressed to me, and it was by Wes, I recognize his writing. It basically said that this was his son, and he had been having an affair since we were trying to conceive because there was an emotional disconnect and distance between us that he just could not bridge. It started out as something purely physical, but when he got to know that I would never be able to be a mother to his child, something inside him flipped. And it was at that time that his affair partner got pregnant. So he thought that this was divine intervention and that he was meant to have the baby, and he and his affair partner went ahead with it. However, he says that it was getting unbearable for her and him to stay away, and that he was leaving with her, but leaving their child with me. When I first read it, it felt as though someone had pranked me. But at the exact same time, my phone buzzed, and I got the same message in the form of a text from him, verbatim. 
So I knew this was not a prank. I tried calling him, but he didn't pick up my calls and texted me that he would not be coming back, and would neither be talking to me. I just could not believe what had happened to me in a matter of minutes. He had gone to take groceries, and now he had left me with a two-year-old kid? I rushed to our room and checked every drawer and closet, and I saw most of his important and sentimental items were gone. Most of his clothes were there, but he had taken enough for sustenance and survival. My head was reeling, and I sank to the floor crying, and I saw the little boy, whose name I did not even know, come to me with his little blue water bottle, and offer me water. I don't know why, but I could not feel anything but love and pity for the kid. I should have felt rage he was the embodiment of my husband's infidelity, I should have felt disgust because he was the reason my family broke down, and I should have felt fear because here was a kid that I was now suddenly responsible for, and I was not mentally prepared to take on this responsibility, but I did not feel all those things. I just felt bad for him. He had been abandoned by the two people who were supposed to love him the most. I asked him what his name was, and he said it was Noah. I think I did not have a lot of time to grieve because I knew that I had to do something about him. Putting him up for adoption was not an option because I know how the adoption system works, and it would have just ruined his life. I could try and reach out to his family, but I didn't even know who they were, or I could adopt him. I decided that I would try and look for his family, until the time I don't find them, I'll take care of him. The next few days went in a blur. Both he and I were getting used to this new reality, but the best thing about this was that he was a very easy kid. In the sense that he was very friendly and wasn't suspicious of me, and didn't rebel or ignore me either. I think I was the one who was more suspicious of him, even though it wasn't his fault. He was the one who was caught in the crossfire for no fault of his, quite like me, and maybe that was also why I couldn't bring myself to hate him or be angry at him. Two weeks after the revelation, I got divorce papers in the mail. They were signed by Wes. I didn't waste any time, contacted my lawyer, and got done with it because I had much more important things to take care of. For the next six months, I tried everything to get hold of Noah's family. I even tried reaching out to Wes, and made my lawyer do it too but I just couldn't find any trace of them. I tried asking around in Wes' office, but they had no idea whatsoever. And in all this time, I slowly but surely got attached to Noah. He became the light of my life. I had never felt happier than I did when I was with him. I just loved the little guy so much, and it felt as though he really was my son. He even called me mama, and I didn't stop him. I was there for him when he had his nightmares, I taught him how to tie his shoelaces, I put up his drawings on my fridge. We were a little family, and it took me some time to realize that we were a family. When after six to seven months, I could not get hold of any biological relative of his, I decided to legally adopt him. I had thought that it would have been a problem, but, thankfully, my lawyer was great and the paperwork happened seamlessly. I had West texts and note with me, and I was honest about the entire situation. They said that since this was a case of abandonment of the child, the adoption would pass through easily, and it did. I became his mother officially, even though I think I had become his mother when the first time I saw him. I knew that I didn't have it in me to abandon the child and leave him to fend for himself. That was just not me. And since then, it has been the two of us. He is six years old now and goes to school. He has made a few friends, which I was sure he would, especially since he is such a social and funny little guy. I have been doing pretty well for myself, so the finances are no issue at all. My parents are a little miffed with me for taking in my ex's affair child, but they don't say much because they know I'm really attached to Noah. Life was going well, and I had adjusted to the new reality and was even enjoying it, when everything came crashing down. Last week, I had a visitor. It was Wes. When I opened the door, I couldn't believe my eyes. I should have slammed the door in his face right then, but I was too startled to give a reaction. The only thing I'm thankful about is that Noah was in school at that point in time, or else it would have gotten really messy. Wes said that he wanted to talk to me and just pushed the door open and made himself welcome. It took me a solid minute to gather my thoughts, and I asked him to leave my house, or I would press charges. He said that I didn't need to overreact so much and that he was just here to see his son and take him back. I looked at him as if he were nuts. I told him that he did not have a son and that he had relinquished all rights to the kid when he and his mistress abandoned him at my doorstep. He asked me where Noah was, but I didn't say anything. I didn't want to give out any information to him, and I was feeling scared, to be honest. I didn't answer any questions at all because I didn't want him to know that I still had Noah and had legally adopted him. He said that he had given me his son to take care of, not to put into the system. That was when I realized that he thought I had probably handed over Noah to the authorities. I allowed him to think that way and didn't correct him, because honestly, why should I? The less he knows, the better it is for me. I told him that I had no idea what he was talking about and that if he ever tried to get in touch with me again, I would go ahead and press charges. He left without a fuss, but I know this is not over. And now I have to pick Noah up from school, and I am worried that he is going to follow me and find out. I am too scared, and I cannot lose my son. Update 1, this is a small update, guys. My hunch was right. He was waiting around the corner for me to leave so that he could follow me. I called up one of my colleagues from work and asked her if she could pick Noah up from school. Her daughter is in the same class as him. She said okay and asked me if there was something wrong. 
I told her that I would give her the details later. I just don't want him following me around or finding out where Noah studies. I don't trust this man at all. She picked Noah up, and he was with her for a while, and I'm going to go pick him up from her place now. I can't see Wes car, so I think he has left. I just hope he doesn't come back, but I know deep down that this isn't over. I just hope I can save my kid and myself from his entitled ass because I cannot afford to lose Noah. He is everything to me. Update 2, I am sorry for the delay in the update, but a lot has been happening, and I wasn't in the right state of mind. The day Wes came home, I was genuinely very scared. I got Noah home at night and told him that he had to be very careful and not talk to any strangers at all. He got a little frightened, but we got through it. I also spoke to my lawyer and asked him if Wes had any legal standing with regard to Noah, and he said that Wes could legally not take him away from me, but if he was showing dangerous behavior, I could get a restraining order against him. I don't have much against him right now, so I have to wait this out. A week after that, on a Sunday to be exact, Wes came home again. I tried to keep him out with all my might, but he barged in and made his way through and started calling for Noah. God bless my sweet, smart, child, he just did not come out of his room. Wes then broke down crying and said that he wanted to meet his son just once and that he would leave me alone. I told him that he was not his son anymore, and he had no choice but to leave me alone because if he didn't leave the premises, I would call the police. That made him panic a little, and he begged me to just hear him out. He tried really hard to turn his infidelity and the subsequent karma that he got for it into a heart-wrenching sob story, but I was having none of it. I had no love for this man anymore, and nothing that he would say could make me feel sorry for him. He said that because of our fertility struggles, he started an affair with a woman, and when she got pregnant with his kid, he felt that it was something that was just meant to be. But because he loved me a lot, he could not leave me for her, despite knowing that I couldn't give him the family that he wanted. And then, during COVID, when he left, it was because his affair partner was pregnant again. She said that she did not want two kids, and according to Wes, the best course of action was to have one kid with each woman that he loved. I looked at him in disbelief because I had never heard anything as idiotic as this before. I told him to eat shit and that I wasn't buying anything that he was saying, but he begged me to listen further. He had another son with that woman and married her too, but soon after, they met with an accident. It was his fault he was driving drunk, and he had his son with him, and the son met with a major accident because of his reckless behavior. Wes faced injuries too, and now he can never have children of his own again. The affair partner, then wife, was furious with him, naturally so, and I don't blame her one bit for this, and she left him. The kid is fine now, but she has full custody of him, and he has no visitation, and he won't ever be able to change that because he was the one who endangered the life of the kid. So now, all his dreams of having a big family have come crashing down, and the only way that he can have a child and experience true fatherhood, and by that, he means biological fatherhood, is if I allow him in Noah's life. He thought that this little story of his would move me to tears, and I would go running to wipe his tears and be his shoulder to cry on. I told him to get lost because he got this upon himself. I told him that he needed psychological help because clearly, he isn't cut out to be a father, and I said God did a favor to humanity by making him infertile. I told him that he had two existing children, and he had failed both of them. One he abandoned because he couldn't handle or manage two children, and the other one he almost killed because he had no control or sense of responsibility. I told him that he did not gift me Noah because he felt bad for me because that was a bullshit explanation and even he knew it. He abandoned Noah because the reality of raising two young children was giving him cold feet. I told him that both he and his now ex-wife sucked because they left a two-year-old to fend for himself, and God had a special place reserved in hell for him. He was crying by the end and said that he deserved every single insult that I was hurling at him and that he would do anything to prove himself to me, but he just wanted another chance with his son. I told him that he was delusional if he thought I was going to let him come anywhere near me or my son again and that the only suitable place for him at this point was a mental asylum. I had to literally shove him out of my house, but I am glad he is gone. Right after he left, I went to check on Noah. He was scared, but I sat with him, and now he's feeling better. I have spoken to my lawyer, and he says that now I have enough testimony to get an actual restraining order against Wes, and that is what I will be doing. He is deranged, and I am not going to endanger my family because a grown man can't deal with the consequences of his own actions. Hopefully, I will not have a reason to update anymore. Please pray for the safety of my family.